Last week, we just started into a little a small series, a two-week series. We'll end it, end it today. Uh, we just kind of dove into it last week. We called it Just Like Jesus, and we're going to conclude it uh, this week. I don't know if there's any um, more challenging um, issue before us than as Christ representatives uh, to take him to our neighbors and take him to our neighborhoods and take him to our communities uh, around the world. And uh, it is impossible without the help and work of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. The scripture is very clear that God is always at work in us. I don't know about you, but this brings me hope that God is always at work in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And we found out last week, we just touched on a, a few verses of scripture, but from Romans in chapter 8 and verse 29, that this is not just a nice thought, that we are actually, we've actually been destined to be conformed to the image of the Son, Jesus Christ. I want you to see that with me on the screen. We have it in your Bible, Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to, to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn or the preeminent one among many brethren. And so, again, it's not just a nice thought. It's not a nice idea. It's not just something we can, again, sort of aspire to because it has real value to it. It's more than that. It's actually God who set his love on men, also set, uh, set, this, for, set this in place for them. He predestined them to actually be conformed to the image of his son. Now, God always is out for our best, and so this must be among the best that God has for us, again, to be conformed to the image of his Son. I want to give you three commitments today that, that you can carry into your future with you, and again, with the help of the Holy Spirit, really lean into and see accomplished in your life that will lead to success in becoming more and more uh, like Jesus Christ. The first one is just a commitment to Jesus first and foremost. If you haven't already done that, that's where you begin that's where life begins anyway. All of us were dead in our sins and trespasses. The Bible says that's Bible language. We were all, uh, um, we were, because we were living independent of God, we were still in a state of sin. And sin always brings us to a place of death. All have sinned, the Bible says, and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is always death. Thank God for Jesus who came into our world, he said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And because of his kindness, his generosity, his mercy, and his grace, and through just faith in him, we have received eternal life. That abundant life is already in our possession for those of, who, those of us who are following Jesus today. But there's an awful lot that needs to happen after we receive Jesus as Lord and receive eternal life. Uh, between that, that moment, that day, and the day we actually leave here to go to be with Jesus face to face. Every day, I don't know if you think about this, but every day uh, we live, sun up to sundown, we're just one day closer, all of us, doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, all of us are just one day closer to seeing Jesus face to face. Amen. Now the rapture could happen today, we'd all go in the twinkling of an eye, but if that doesn't happen today, we're still one day closer to seeing Jesus face to face. In our lives, we'll have to count for the way that we lived our lives. And again, if you're going to reach for something and attach yourself to something that's going to pull you into each new day and bring a freshness to your day, it could be something like this. Today, I believe I'm being more changed into the image of Jesus Christ. You'll never be Jesus. That's not the goal. There's only one Jesus. Our, one of our goals, again, we're predestined to, to this, is to actually be conformed to the image of his son. So that's where life begins. We pass from death to life when we make Jesus Christ the Lord of our life. You can never again, let me just say it, make sure we're all on the same page. You can never be good enough to get this on your own. You can never work hard enough. You, you can never be pure enough on your own, by yourself, by your own best efforts, all right? to uh, somehow earn or merit eternal life. It's not going to happen. And if somebody's taught you that's what it takes, you need to just turn a deaf ear to that. You need to ask them to stop making stuff up. And get back to the Bible. The Bible makes it clear we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right? And so, again, it starts with Jesus and a commitment to Jesus. If we're going to be conformed to his image, we have to commit 
to Jesus and commit to, he, to who he, he is. Does that make sense to you? You know, Jesus did this where the Father God is concerned. And I want you to see this. I don't know if you've ever seen these verses from John. I, I love, by the way, turn with me over to John, the 12th chapter, while I'm just talking to you. But in John, the 12th chapter, we have some scripture that shows us that Jesus set this in motion in his own life where the Father was concerned. In other words, Jesus lived his life in order to represent faithfully the Father God. He was so given to it. I mean, so given to, again, not presenting himself, but presenting the Father through the way he lived his life. That in John chapter 14, 9, he would say this to Philip, who said, show us the Father. Uh, Jesus would say to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know, that must have pleased Jesus when he heard, you know, uh, when, when uh, that began to happen and he began to see it happen in his own life because that, again, was his major endeavor was not to be on his own, not to operate on his own, uh, not to operate in his own power, his own authority, but to operate from that place of the Father God and his relationship with the Father God. Now, that's been passed on to us uh, to, to represent Jesus. Uh, Peter said it this way in one place. He said, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his, his light. But here in John chapter 12, before Jesus ever made that statement about if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, verses 49 and 50 of John chapter 12, read this way. For I have not spoken of myself, this is Jesus speaking, I've not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that this commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Amen. And so again, Jesus brought himself to a place in, in his own life and ministry where he was going to, he was committed to the Father and following the Father and having his life emulate and represent the Father. And now we've been sent, Jesus would say, as the Father sent me, so I've sent you. Now we have been sent as disciples, as followers of Jesus, not to represent ourselves, but to represent him. Jesus in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5 is referred to as uh, a faithful witness. Everybody say that out loud, a faithful witness. The word witness is interesting. It's where we get the, the word martyr from. The Greek word is a, a word that we get the English word martyr from. It's somebody who, again, has committed their life to a certain cause, a certain person, willing to die for it, willing to do whatever it takes to uh, honor the person that they're committed to or the cause they're committed to. And we're committed to Jesus Christ. And so we are his witnesses. In fact, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus told his disciples, he said this, he said, tarry in Jerusalem and wait uh, until you're empowered from on high with the Holy Ghost, then you'll be my witnesses. So again, in order to see that happen in our life, to represent Jesus faithfully, we first have to make this incredible commitment. John was that way. And I think when John writes these sorts of things, we need to really sit up and listen because John, you know, had, a, he had an incredible relationship, it seemed, with Jesus and even closer than many of the other disciples. He just loved. He saw things about Jesus that other, others didn't see who were within the same proximity of Jesus. He just noticed things about him. You know, John's gospel starts off that way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him. Without him, there was nothing made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And what a great revelation of the preexistent Jesus. And John saw that because his heart was so toward Jesus. And so when John writes these sorts of things, he noticed about Jesus. He knows how close Jesus was to the Father, and it impacted him. And it impacted him in such a way where he wanted to be close to Jesus that way. And so when, you know, I, I think John just wanted, and like we should want and desire, to, uh, again, faithfully represent, be a witness of who Jesus is. You've got to commit to this thing. You've got to want it, and you've got to commit to it, because the devil will fight you every step of the way. The second thing, the second commitment we need to make is to receive the engrafted word. 
to receive the engrafted word. Hang on for uh, part, uh, number three. It'll, it, it'll make even more sense to you when we, we talk about this just a little bit. But James chapter 1 and verse 21 says that. It says, says it, so get rid of all uncleanness and the rampant outgrowth of wickedness. And in a humble, gentle, modest spirit, receive and welcome the word which implanted and rooted in your hearts contains the power to save your soul. Now, your spirit has been changed if you're a Christian, but your soul is in the process of being changed. And one of the ways it begins to experience the salvation of God is as we receive the engrafted word of God. This is going to be part of that process of being conformed to the image of Jesus. If I commit myself to Jesus, to the image of Jesus that the Bible portrays, the faithful image that the Bible portrays, and then secondly, I commit myself to receive what really is going to change me. And it's going to be the word of God. The word engrafted is an interesting word. It just means to be implanted, implanted by the instruction in this, in this particular case of somebody else. And James says, receive, before he says, be a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. This is the statement he makes. He says, receive the engrafted word of God, which is able, it has the power to save the, the soul. I'm not a medical expert. Certainly, we, make, we have some in the room, I think. But recently, we've heard more and more talk about stem cells and what stem cells can do. Of course, there's been some controversy about stem cells uh, as well. But I have to tell you, there's something about um, life being in the blood. That's biblical from Leviticus chapter 28. In fact, I recently went through a procedure in my right knee, and it involved taking... Uh, my own blood and taking stem cells from my own blood, adult stem cells, and re-injecting them into the damaged area of my knee with the hope that those stem cells will begin to regenerate or repair and regenerate uh, different types of cells or, or tissue in that knee that had been damaged. It's incredible. Again, I, I, I sound stupid talking about it. Somebody like my doctor could tell you more and more about it, but I, I questioned him more than once. Tell me what's going to happen here. He says, well, the hope is, is we're going to send these stem cells into your knee. We're going to inject it, which was the only hard part. We're going to inject it into your knee, and those stem cells are going to get in there, and they're going to figure out what they need to be. And they're just going to figure it out. If they need to be bone cells or cartilage cells or, or some other type of cell, they're going to get in there, if they, and they're going to begin to rebuild those damaged areas. Sounds kind of like Twilight Zone stuff or sci-fi stuff, but this is our reality, our present day reality. And they can get it from your blood. They can get it from fat cells. I told him I got a whole lot more of those. <laughs> if we need to go there, he said, we can get it from your bone marrow. We can go where it's really rich. Uh, but we can, we can do that if we have to do that. I said, well, let's just do this first. So we went in there, and he took like 40 cc's of my, my blood, and he spun it in a centrifuge. He separated the different kind of cells out. He fished for the stem cells, and he pulled them into another much smaller syringe, about 7 cc's. And he took that needle, which is about that long, and he took that needle, and he put it right into my right knee. It all took about 45 minutes, but I've got to tell you, in the weeks to come, I began to feel incredible relief in my knee. I had, I had been having to go to bed at night and actually ice my knee to get comfortable enough to go to sleep. That almost immediately shifted and changed. Not quite immediately, but almost immediately. And I began to receive strength. And someone would ask me, some of you asked me, how's your knee? You knew I had the procedure. And I would say to you, if you remember, it feels like something's growing in my knee. And so here I am now months later, and my knee is stronger than it has been in years and years and years and years. I'm telling you, there's life in the blood. God puts something in our bodies. Now, why are you going to that, Pastor? Because when I read this verse, I think of 2 Timothy 3.16. Because what happened to me that day was stem cells were engrafted into my body. I received them. They took hold and they brought about a desired change or transformation. That's what happens when God's word is received 
by you and me. We've got to receive it, not just hear it, but we've got to actually, like this morning, some of you are hearing it, some of you are taking it in, some of you are writing notes, some of you plan already to meditate or get the CD, you're going to hear it again and again. Some of you will be done when we're done today. You'll say, thank God that was a short service. We can get on with our Memorial Day weekend and we're done. It's not going to benefit you. It was offered you. The help was there for you, okay? But you didn't receive it and take it in to your heart. And so it's not going to benefit you. It just won't benefit you. Others of you, it will benefit because of how you see the Word of God and the honor you give to God's Word, whoever shares it, whether it's a man or a woman, whether it's a young person, an older person, it doesn't matter. If a mule speaks the Word of God, if it's the Word of God, you're going to take it because you value the Word of God. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, is a great reminder that the Word of God is alive. The Holy Scripture, God breathed, as strange as it, as it may sound, is actually alive. It is, has, this is God's DNA, it is his breath DNA. This is his voice print. And you and I, when we open it, ask for the Holy Spirit's help in understanding it, that life, again, the word is alive, that life is released into our lives. Can I have a good amen? It's very powerful. So 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Now, here's what, here, here again is what, what it says. All scripture, say all scripture. all scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God is what? Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Just like a stem cell. A stem cell gets into our bloodstream and whatever we need, it can become. And that's our hope that that's what it becomes. The Word of God can be released into our life. We can receive it, and it can become to us all of these different things. It can become the correction. It can become the doctrine. It can become the reproof. It can become the instruction. It, beca it can become health and healing. Did you know that? Amen. Psalm 107 says God just spoke His Word, and it brought healing and deliverance for His people. The R Roman centurion experienced that concerning his servant. Just speak the word only, Jesus, and they'll be healed. And so even today, you may have come in and you're not even, know, you're not even sure what you need. You don't even know how to diagnose your issue. Guess what? The word of God is an answer for that. Amen. And if you just receive it, the word, because it's alive, can enter into your heart and become that to you. Amen? And so what does this have to do with being more and more like Jesus? Well, exactly that. Because Jesus is the word. Amen. And so we receive the Word of God. If we fully receive it, it begins to work in us, build on the inside of us. That Again, that transformation takes place, and we are more and more conf con uh, conformed to the image of uh, who Jesus Christ is. Amen. I, I, to this day, I just give you my, my own personal testimony concerning this. There are days that I have that are just miserable days. There, there are days that I just, I just wake up, and it's already a miserable day. And some of you are looking at me like, not you. Yeah, yeah. But I tell you the truth. I can sit and open my Bible and just read it. Not even study it. Not even pray over it. I just start reading my Bible and something shifts on the inside of me. Something changes on the inside of me. How does that happen? The Word of God is alive. Powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Amen? Amen. So receive, he said, with what? Meekness. Be teachable. Be humble about it. Right? There's some people that don't receive anything from God because they're not teachable. You like to teach, but you don't like to be taught. That needs to change and let God speak into your life. Amen. And when we do that, we receive with meekness the engrafted word. It begins to save our soul or transform our soul. Amen. So commit to Jesus. Commit to receiving what? The engrafted word. And number three, we have to commit to what, what we refer to as the process. Everybody say the process. Commit to the process. Again, even Jesus knew this. He began learning from the scripture when he was a young child and he gave himself to the scripture over time, it began to shape how he saw himself, began to give light to his mission on earth, etc., etc. You know, he was dependent on what God 
had to say about him, what the scripture, how the scripture would guide him in his own life. If Jesus needed that, how much more do you and I need that? Isn't that the truth, church? How much more do we need it? And so process it. Now, we live in a society, you know this, it's not much given to process. We're not real happy about process. We want what we want right now. Like some of you want me to stop right now, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to go on a little bit longer, and I'm going to keep you in the process. Amen? I mean, but come on. I mean, we don't even like a drive through a, a line anymore because it's not fast enough for many of us. You know, I, when I get in a drive through and I'm in a McDonald's drive through you know, healthy food. When I'm in a drive through and, you know, and I, I go enough where I'm, I'm afraid they already know me by my first name. Certain stores in the city. But I'll get in a line, and someone will be ordering ahead of, ahead of me, and they're taking forever. And I just want to say, you know, this is not a fine restaurant. It's not hard. I'm going over, and, and God's correcting me, shut up, you know. But, but I'm just going, you know, um, this is a process. But even that process is, has become too long and lengthy for some of us. We're so used to it. How many of you are afraid of microwave ovens when they first came out? Were you afraid of them or were you just curious about them? How many of you went out and bought one right away? Did you really? Men and women of faith, you didn't even wait for consumer reports to come out. <laughs> it took me a while to just get confident that this was going to be okay. But now, my God, you have to wait for somebody to cook your food? Are you kidding me? And we see that in all aspects of society, man. We, you know, we don't, you know, I want to join the gym. I don't want to work out. I want to be, you're laughing because you've thought the same thing. I, I want to join the club and sit in the parking lot and, and get in shape. But that's not going to happen, is it? There's process. The wedding is an event. The marriage is a process okay being born again is a miracle it's the event but the process christianity is a process it's learning how to to live a life the way we should live our life amen and they should work together you don't live your life on one or the other a diet of one or the other miracles and processes actually dovetail together sometimes miracles god uses a miracle in your life which again happens suddenly and quickly miracles in our life to start a process. Or he might use a miracle in our life, watch this, to revive a process that's gotten old or tired. Probably when we're about to quit, give up, a miracle happens to get the process going again. But then living in a process can also give way to miracles and new miracles working in our life. And God intends for all of us to be giving ourselves to both of those. Being conformed to the image of Jesus is really a matter of being transformed. And the Greek word translated transformed is met, metamorpho, which is where we get the word metamorphosis from. When we think of metamorphosis, we're thinking about mostly, there can be a sudden change, but mostly we're thinking about change over time. Isn't that right? And so I think we have to commit to process. Again, miracles can happen along the way, but being conformed to the image of Jesus is more a matter of process and staying committed to the process. You ever wonder why the devil works so hard on all of us to get us to quit anything when it comes to God and following God? Because when we're committed to following God, what we're trusting God for is coming to pass. And we, the only thing that's going to stop it, because the devil can't stop it unless you and I stop it. Unless we give in, unless we give up. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because the devil has been defeated. It's a 2,000-year-old defeat. Amen. It's been in place a long time. Some of us are just finding out about it, but the devil's been defeated a long time. What he's really good at, though, is deceiving us and lying to us and getting us to think something that's just not true. The Bible says, resist the devil. He has to flee from you. He can't stay. But what he can do is he can lie to you about things and get you to a point where you're discouraged, you want to quit, you want to give up, you want to stop, stop short. Some of us are right on the threshold of receiving fully what we've been praying for. And sadly, some of us won't even cross that threshold because we'll quit. We'll stop the process. 
before it's time. How sad is that? To abort a dream that God has put into our hearts. That God has been working on with you all this time. Don't stop. Don't quit. Say it out loud. It's too soon. Too soon to quit. Amen. And so the reason I bring that up is because the Bible teaches us that this being conformed to Jesus is a matter of process. I showed you this from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I think it was last week. But look at it again, verse 18 in particular. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image. Watch this. It speaks of process. From what? Glory to glory. That speaks of process. We go from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. A couple of points here. Again, this is a supernatural divine process. Let's keep it that. How do we keep it that? By keeping our trust in God and not ourselves for it. The second thing, again, is that it is process. The Amplified Bible says we're being changed from one degree of glory to the next. Now, I'm not certainly not perfect, and all of you in here who know me know that, but I am not the same person I was when I made Jesus Christ Lord of my life back in 1973. I'm not everything I want to be, but I'm not everything I used to be. I handle people better. I handle life better. I handle myself better. I handle things better. Okay, not to perfection, but I handle all things better because along the way, this process, I've been changed here and I've been changed there. Changed a little here, changed a little there, and there's more to come. Can I have a good amen to that? Just from one degree. But watch how he says this happens. He says, it's like looking in a mirror. How many of you looked in a mirror already today? What did the rest of you do? I mean, how did you? I'll ask again. How many of you looked in a mirror today? There we go. Why were you afraid to answer that question? All of us are familiar with mirrors, but this is a different kind of mirror. Altogether, a different kind of mirror. Because the mirror we're looking in, it, we see ourselves. We see our face. We see our image. We actually see a reflection of, of our face in the mirror. And yet, when we look into this mirror, what we're seeing is not us. What we're seeing is Jesus Christ. It's, there's no other mirror like it on the planet. When we look in this mirror, what we're seeing is Jesus Christ. And that's what God wants to show us. Hear, hear me in this. God doesn't want to show you all your warts and all your wrinkles and every gray hair that pops up. He doesn't, want to sh- he doesn't want to show you that you have one eyebrow that's a little bit lower than the other or an earlobe that's got a big crease in it and the other one doesn't. He doesn't want to show you certain things. He wants to show you how he sees you. And he sees you in the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And that compels you upward. It compels you forward. It advances you in life. It causes you to hope. And and in that hope, God begins this work uh, because every substantial change in your life is going to begin with divine hope. And God gives that. And as we look in this mirror, now religion doesn't teach us this, but the Holy Ghost does. When we look in this mirror and behold in this mirror the image of Jesus, that's when we, be, we start being transformed. Here some, there some. Amen. But it takes us beholding ourselves in this mirror. Other mirrors out there, but this is the one you want to look into and look at in order to be transformed. Amen. Did you know the same is true over in James chapter 1? Where he says, be a, hearer, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Did I say this last week in first service? That that word doer comes from a Greek word that we get the English word poet from. He says, don't be a, just a hearer of the word, but be a poet. Really, literally. What does that mean? In that, in that day, especially in that day, in ancient days, they're ancient. The poet was a master expressionist. He would take things on the inside that people were thinking, invisible things within themselves, and he would somehow fashion it to where it would bring understanding on the outside when he spoke it in the form of poetry. And so a poet was thought of even more than a vocalist, more than um, an artist, uh, more than um, 
other types of artisans, the poet was thought of as the master expressionist. So what we're seeing in our Bibles is this. Don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a master expressionist. Of who? Jesus. And so he talks about, remember, he says a man who just looks into the mirror and says he beholds himself in the mirror, but he doesn't apply himself while he's there. He's not thoughtful while he's there, walks away from that experience and forgets what he saw in the, in the mirror. Right? And he urges believers to go to the mirror thoughtfully, to behold thoughtfully, and then to begin to apply or exercise what needs to be exercised in order to be changed or become a master expressionist. I want to be a master expressionist when it comes to Jesus and who Jesus is. Amen. How about you? I mean, it's the biggest thing on my heart is when people see me live my life that somehow it communicates Jesus to them. That's where my heart goes. And so this is how it happens. I, I behold myself in a glass. The mirror in James chapter 1 is the same mirror that's mentioned over in 2 Corinthians in chapter 3. When you hold it up, you don't see you, you see Jesus. And you see, because you see Jesus, you see how God sees you and wants you to be. All right? And you, you notice other things that are out of place, obviously, when you see Jesus. But instead of the response being condemnation, accusation, try, more self-effort is released in your life, you put more faith in God. You put more faith in Jesus. God, I can't be that without your help. God, God would say back to you, I never ask you to do this without my help. Stop it. Trust me. And so we become, we behold this mirror, we see Jesus, and as we see Jesus, we're becoming more and more like him. Amen. And then as we apply those changes in our life, the Bible says to exercise, there's a word, exercise ourselves unto godliness. Okay, And that's where putting things in practice really begins to take hold. Part of the process begins to take hold, and we begin to change. Again, you can join a gym, but if you never lift a weight, you can't hope for, for change. When you get into the mirror and you begin to see how God sees you, but you don't stay long enough to see how that's going to adjust an attitude or adjust a way of thinking or adjust an action or a behavior or a choice, you, you, you get away too quickly then nothing happens. The change doesn't take place. Right? But when you do, here's the result. Because you're not just a hearer of the word, but you're also a doer of the word. You're exercising yourself unto godliness. Amen. Does that help you this morning at all? It really helps me. A commitment to Jesus, a commitment to receive his engrafted word. People looking for answers a lot of different places. God's word's the place to look. Amen. And God's word is the place to stay. And then also be, you know, put this thing to work. Make a commitment to the whole process of just growing in, in God. Amen? Jesus went to church. So if I'm being conformed to the image of his son, I'm coming to church. The Bible says he was in the synagogue daily. We've got a lot of Christians that don't think like that. Well, they're not being conformed to the image of Jesus. Because Jesus was in church daily. Jesus was in church. Amen. When you and I start looking for reasons to be out of church instead of in church, something's gone haywire. Something's amiss in our life. You can blame that on whoever you want to blame it on every day, but it's still your choice whether you're here or you're not here. If you're not a giver, you're not being conformed to the image because Jesus was a, the consummate giver. If you don't learn kindness, you're not being conformed to the image of his son. If you're just, you were born again, forgiven of your sin, but your life hasn't changed much after that, you haven't given yourself to the process of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And these are just simple thoughts that will get you to a place where that really begins to happen.